Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm here today to film my 5k q and I don't know who started these traditions of reaching a milestone of subscribers and doing a Q&A, but I quite like it because I think it updates people on sort of who've just joined or just a chance to answer some questions. So I asked over on Instagram and on my um, community tab here on YouTube if you guys had any questions. I Some of these I definitely answered before, but like I said, for the benefit of new people, I thought this would be... Um, maybe helpful or you could just put it on while you're having a cup of tea if that is um if you've heard me talk about these things before but anyway they're in a completely random order I was gonna organize them and then I got I don't know too confused so they're just gonna be quite random in the way that they were sent in and I'm gonna reply to them so the first question I'm also not gonna put them on the screen so I don't want to put people's um what you call it usernames on like because I didn't say that I was gonna do that uh, anyway, people said, um, how are your knitting projects going? I got a few questions about knitting and slowly this year or the year that just went, I really slowed down on knitting mostly because I had a lot of trouble with my hands um, and really bad hand tremors, which makes it surprisingly hard to knit, particularly knit like with smaller needles um, because I just can't get the precision. So yeah, that's been a real shame and has been quite gutting for just like another thing I feel like I'm losing. But um, I have one sleeve to finish on a jumper I started at the very start of the year and I'm sure lots of knitters watching will feel the same but like I never knit in the summer. I had really good intentions to knit this summer. I even bought my knitting stuff with me on a trip but um, yeah I didn't get around to it. So yeah I really want to finish the sleeves on that and then I want to start a mohair cardigan. It's like a stripy cardigan that's like quite lightweight which I think will be nice for spring. Um, but yeah they're going slowly but they're still going. Um, but I do think I take quite big breaks from it, so I have to sort of reteach myself a bit every time I pick them back up. But yeah, that's knitting. Um, someone asked, books I'll never stop recommending to people. It's so hard. I'd be interested below if you guys have read any books that I've recommended or if you sort of think about a book and think like, oh, Hannah always talks about that one. Because I feel like for me, I always talk about Disability Visibility, which is a collection of essays edited by Alice Wong. I never stop recommending that because I never stop talking about Disability Justice. Patrick Radden Keefe is like my king, my, my, my like the best non-fiction investigative journalist out there in my view, so I'll never stop talking about him. And Roxane Gay as well, which I feel like I haven't spoken that much about her recently because I basically read everything about her novel um, and I was like weird thing I'm like saving the novel for I don't know because I don't know when we're getting more Roxanne Gay because I know she has lots of other endeavours these days um, but yeah her so much of her non-fiction writing informed my sort of my educational feminism and my self-growth and stuff like that so I'll never stop talking about how much I love her and in fiction oh and in the dream house by Carla Maria Machado I think is such an excellent um, experimental and playful kind of non-fiction writing I think is so clever. I haven't read her short stories mostly because one of my friends really hated them and I don't want her work to be tainted by um, her short stories. They don't sound like they're going to be my kind of thing anyway but um, yeah I haven't read them but and then fiction wise it's hard I feel like that comes more in ebbs and flows but I'll never stop loving Ocean Wong. Vong. I literally have his book title tattooed on me so I can't really stop hating that, um, can't really stop loving that and Colin Barrett for short stories I would always help people to read. Um, okay next question was advice for sick people who want to write. Um, I think I hesitate to give advice sort of specifically on this because I know sickness is sort of so varied and complicated for lots of people but my advice, I think, goes across whatever you're trying to pursue when you're unwell. Um, it's like slow and steady and making a plan, but not being wedded to the plan. For me, like word count go goals don't really help because some days I can write, you know, 700 words and other days I can barely get out 200. So for me, I sort of focus on hourly, like maybe can I try and do 20 minutes this morning? Can I try and do half an hour? Um, and then breaking down whatever your goal is, whether it's to write an essay or a poem or a book, like really thinking about that goal and breaking it down into its most um, manageable chunks and then sort of plotting out what you're going to do from then. I'm a big planner. I love a plan, but sickness and plans don't always go together. So like I say, flexibility is really important. And then the same with anything is just self-compassion, giving yourself a break, not being hard on yourself, like nothing ever gets done if you're horrible to yourself, which is something I think we're all learning all the time. But yeah, self-compassion for your work and sort of 
knowing that not comparing yourself to other people particularly to other like non-disabled people or non-sick people is really really something that i think is important because sort of your pace and someone else's pace are completely incomparable even if someone's not sick like you don't know the other things that go on in people's lives the help they have the help they don't have etc so yeah i think that's really important someone asked about confidence in using mobility aids and i think this is again like i i don't want to give like broad advice for something when i don't really know the circumstances but i think for me it's ongoing it is and it's challenging and it changes with circumstance particularly like I feel like I was in a really good place and then I spent too much time on the internet and read too many people's opinions about me and really sort of started to second guess myself but I think practice is sort of what it is and if you can have someone in your life who can like push you to use the things you need and when you need them and remember that it's all flexible and sort of as and when and I think so much of that confidence for me is like fake it till you make it and also just being surrounded by people who will like egg you on and help you and stuff especially if that's like with a wheelchair like friends who are happy to push you or people who are happy to carry you down the stairs or like whatever it is that you need just having yourself surrounded by people who aren't going to question it is really important and then I think part of that practice for me is also about like reading about disability justice and just making sure I'm surrounded by those experiences all the time because that makes you feel less alone and less like focused on the people who are staring at you and more just focused on like you know the people who do care and even if it's just like people online and stuff that um can understand your experience um i had a couple of questions which i've had like loads of times and i'm sorry to bore people who've had this story before but lots of people asked how i met my boyfriend unfortunately it's a very cliche story we met at machu picchu before i got very unwell we were both on individual like travel trips with our respective friends i was on a 10 month backpacking trip around central and south america he was on a three week break from uni just doing peru and bolivia and we were in the same like organized group that was um hiking and like viewing at machu picchu and we became friends and then he went back to england i came back to england six months later we got chatting about a red hot chili peppers concert that i was going to and as they say the rest is history six years later so that is how i met him and lots of other people said why do you live in amsterdam for the same reason for the same man i live here because my partner's doing his phd here and someone asked will we live here long term and honestly i have absolutely no idea as i mentioned in this video or in another video i'm bulk filming today um i'm just trying to put one foot in front of the other this year and sort of one day at a time one week at a time maybe one month at a time but really not thinking about anything long term because that just sends me into a huge overwhelmed spiral so maybe all i know is i really want children and i really can't care for children by myself like i would need a lot of community and support if i'm going to do that and community and support is most likely back in the uk so who knows we're still young we're still living laughing loving out here it's cool to live in another place but i'm not really sure what the next five ten years holds for us um and then lots of lovely people asked how i was doing how i was really doing and how's my health so that's really kind thank you so much for reaching out thank you so many people who dm me and stuff when i sort of go able on instagram and stuff it's um yeah it's so nice but i'm sort of talking less about the specificities of my health online these days for various reasons but it's not great and there's a general downtrend I would say in my physical condition and some ongoing complications with illness which is really hard and I'm sort of coming to terms with that in the last two and a half years of you know realizing things aren't going to get any better for me realistically in agreement with my doctors like this is sort of it um which is hard and I'm just really for this year want to stay out of the hospital as much as possible <laughs> that would be really nice um and i realized maybe also on youtube my health fluctuation isn't really that obvious and that's sort of a choice i made in the last sort of eight months to yeah start talking about what i'm going through as i'm going through it. i don't think it's very healthy and i think it opens me up to opinions i don't really want to hear and care about from people i don't know but um 
yeah, I'm, I remain very unwell and I make videos when I feel okay, even if that's an hour of a day or, you know, a day of a week, but um, so much happens in between the videos and it's all pretty shit if I'm honest. So yeah, that is the health talk. Sort of leading on from that, people say, what's your favourite and least favourite thing about making content? Uh, my favourite thing is, of course, my friends, the people I've met on here. Um, CJ, Jay, Grace and Kieran were like the first group of friends I made on here and it's just so incredible to me that I like talk to these people in some capacity every single day and I've met Jay, Jay came to Amsterdam and we met up and I met his partner and he met Tom and it was just like now I don't even think about them as my internet friends they're just like I'm just like that's my group chat those are my people that I can go to when things are really shit and um, yeah I'm so grateful for that and on top of them People like Sage, people like Sean and Bert who always check in on me. Me and Sage like to email because we're apparently old people. And yeah, just like the people that's brought me and you guys, people who comment, the names that like reappear on my in my comments or in my DMs of just so much kindness and so much sort of yeah, so much love I feel for people who message me to say like my videos comfort them and it comforts me to know that and know that people sort of um yeah, I can help out someone else's shitty day because I know I have content creators that I watch that do that for me. So I guess I like that that circle that we all find ourselves in. Um, and the worst bit is probably just, you know, other people on the internet, I guess. It's people passing judgment on the on on your life based on 30 minutes of a video that they see. Um, and I think that's definitely contributed to change the way like I talk about my life and sort of things that I go through and when and if I share information about things and I think in some ways I feel like that's a shame because of the messages I get from people that say like thank you so much for talking about Emmy or talking about Enda or whatever it is like um that brings people comfort but at the end of the day I think although that vulnerability is like a useful to people I have to sort of put myself and my own well-being first in some circumstances because yeah the internet's full of just fucking sad people who are horrible for no reason and on that note i actually also have to thank my friends jen and simon who you guys if you're watching me you definitely watch them who are veterans of the book internet space who've helped me so much sort of dealing with that and they're just like the most resilient people when it comes to stuff like that and they've really guided me and helped me sort of admire that in them and not make me want to quit when stuff like that happens so yeah, that is, um, that's the internet chat. So I have some really specific questions that made me laugh. Um, someone said, what's my favourite tea? And then also my opinion on Dutch tea, like flavours of tea available in the Dutch supermarket, which really made me laugh. Um, I hate the own brand tea, like the Albert Hein and the Yumbo tea, I think is shit. But then that's kind of like the same as if I bought Tesco own brand tea. I'm talking about herbal tea, by the way. I don't drink, I drink black tea, but I'm not like loyal to a brand, like, my friend who imports Bowery's, like I don't, I don't care that much about black tea. I'm more of a herbal tea gal. Um, but I buy like what I could buy in the UK, it's just more expensive here, like Clipper and Pucker tea. I like green tea with raspberry or lemon or lemon and ginger, or I like the three mint tea from Pucker. I mostly buy um, like tea bags now. I used to, when I was living in Brighton, it was like super sustainable and ethical and like hard line about things, I used to only buy loose leaf tea, but as aforementioned health is um sort of makes life really hard a lot of the time that now i just buy tea bags because if it means i can have a cup of tea when i'm home alone compared to if tom's out the house then um yeah that's what i do so that's what i enjoy tea wise um i love this question from my friend renee what wardrobe item am i coveting right now i'm coveting a pair of these very expensive from dm they're like low hiker lace-up shoes and they're like a green suede i really thought they might go on sale this christmas but they didn't um they're like very gawp core if you're in the internet fashion space but i'm having a real moment for shoes i got two pairs of shoes from different people for christmas it feels like a bit of a regression because as a teenager i collected trainers like that was my thing like so many pairs of like air max 90s uh Reebok classics like i had all the limited edition ones i'd like buy them on resale sites i was like so into it um but then when I got super into like veganism and sustainability, when I came back from backpacking, I like sold them all and was like really minimalist and gave away so much shit I regret giving away. <laughs> um, but I don't regret it because I don't think those shoes are my style now. But I'm trying to enter my shoe phase again because 
I feel like for a while I was just wearing Birkenstocks in the summer and Dot Martens in the winter and that was it. So yeah, I would love a pair of these and I'm also lusting, not specifically, well I do know which specific ones I want, but they're like £400, but I'm looking for a dupe or a vintage secondhand pair of like traditional fisherman sandals, like a, a thick black leather strap, um, like with a back strap all the way around of like, yeah, very like utilitarian vibe shoe. So that's what I would like at the moment. And someone said, what are my favourite wardrobe pieces right now? I should have got these for you guys. I'm so unorganised. Um, definitely my LF Marky Jameson trousers, which I've talked about loads on Instagram. I'm going to try to put a picture of me wearing them or a picture of them. They're like a heavyweight tracksuit bottom, but with a pocket and a zip. And they look kind of smart, like definitely smart casual. Can wear them out of the house. And they're basically the only trousers I wear when I'm not wearing jeans. Um, and I have them in two colours, in navy and cream. I bought them both on sale. And then second that I'm loving is this jumper with the yin yang on, which is like my favorite jumper of all time. I got it for four quid at a, char at a car boot sale and I've never received more compliments on a jumper in my life. And I know I could probably resell it because the, they're like, it, this isn't a Pasha Mama one, but I know Pasha Mama ones go online now for so much. But yeah, I love this so much. Took me all the way through uni, um, holidays, trips, summer, beach, swimming. Like I just love it so much. It feels like very much a part of my um, my memories now. Um, and then thirdly, I'm loving these wool merino socks I got from Calcedonia earlier in the year. I'm wearing a pair right now. Um, they're just like a lovely ribbed, super soft merino wool, but um, blended with cashmere. And they're only like five euros a pair and you get five. They're always on deal, like three for two or five for four or something. And revamping my sock wardrobe has really upped my style game. On the fashion questions as well, someone said, what inspired your personal style? I really love it. Thank you. It's very kind. It feels like so knobby to include the compliments, doesn't it? But this is, I'm just reading the question. <laughs> um, I think my personal style has definitely evolved and I feel like more comfortable in it sort of now more than ever. I think I... Back, if you can see a, a sort of correlation of things I've spoken about in the past, I am just always have been a person who's like very hard on myself and like strict on rules. And I used to be like, like I said, when I went vegan, I was like, I only buy second hand or I only buy vintage. And I sort of, I think for a while tried to make my style like that, being like, oh, I only wear vintage or I only wear workwear. And I think now my style is more eclectic and mixed and it's a real focus on comfort for a first thing like you're not going to catch me wearing anything uncomfortable because it's never worth it to me um and ease and then i think developing a coordination and like having a color palette that sort of is interesting and not just like beige on beige which i'm not gonna lie is all of amsterdam um but having yeah some key colors that i return to and then using that to shape the pieces I buy but I think other people on the streets is always like a big way to be inspired but like I say definitely don't find Amsterdam as on the whole very fashionable I feel like there's they've got the real like beige on beige loungewear Kardashian style like has the Amsterdam girls by a chokehold which is depressing um I think occasionally like in certain spaces I go to I see some cool people but nothing like London or Brighton where I'd like constantly be seeing people being like oh my god that's a sick outfit so that's a shame but um, vintage imagery, like vintage photographs really, I think, inspire me as well. And sort of looking at colour palettes that people use and then deciding what pieces fit into like the rules that I have. Not rules, but like sort of the, the formulas I use for my wardrobe. And then on top of that, it's just sort of looking at something and seeing if it, it makes me feel good. And like I'm such a mood dresser and like getting dressed is such an important part of my sort of my ritual and my feeling good about myself I get dressed for me so I think things that I just see and feel like oh that's really beautiful then I'll buy them you know and having those fun pieces that like this that yin yang jumper I'm like that just brings me so much joy to wear it to own it to look at it in my wardrobe so then that's like a no-brainer if I saw that in a charity shop I would pick it up kind of thing but I you know personal style is really hard I think especially in the, like the hyper fast trend cycle we live in now um it's almost difficult to decide what you like and what you don't like. But one of the other fashion YouTubers I watched did a video about, she does lots of videos about trends. I will link one down below. But she was talking about sort of how you know whether or not you like something is if, if it's the first time you look at it and you're like, wow, love it. Whereas if it's like you have to see something six or seven or ten times. She was using the example of like the Ultra Mini Uggs. 
She was like, I used to think they're ugly and then I saw them so often and I thought, maybe I like them. But you're not, you don't really like them, you've just sort of been like indoctrinated to look at them so much that you suddenly don't find them as ugly as you first did. Which I think is quite funny. Um, <clears throat> and then someone also asked me about my jewellery, which I always feel really bad because people always mess me about that and I never have any answers for you because pretty much all of my jewellery is vintage, both these necklaces were my grandmother's. This ring was from a trip to India. This is from a car boot sale. This is my mum's. But I do have one new to tell you and I'm not flipping you off, I swear. This is new. Someone said, I love your signet ring. And another question. This one had a little T in it and I bought me and my boyfriend Tom matching ones. His has an H in it because I'm horrendously soppy like that. From a really cool girl who makes them. Um, she's called Nighttime Holiday. I will link her down below. Tom's one is like square and wavy and... I just got the classic shape and she engraves them or she can do all different things on the smiley faces and stuff like that so yes i will link her because she's great quality like handmade sterling silver and i love her and in terms of other jewelry uh yeah vintage is where i get it mostly in like jewelry quarters of different areas we were really lucky in brighton because we lived in such a like there was such a huge vintage jewelry market and collection there and then portobello market in london and I think there's a jewellery quarter in Birmingham, but yeah, that and then travelling, like India has great silver and gold, so unfortunately I don't have many points. Oh, I also like Posh Totti in Brighton, which is like um, a sterling silver workshop place, you can get quite nice stuff in there. Um, more style questions, but about my house. People said, where do you get your interior design inspo from? I love your home. Thank you very much. Um, I really don't know. <laughs> this is a really hard question. I think to me it feels very intuitive. Like, and I think I've inherited this from my mum maybe, but like, I just know what I like and I like what I like and you can't change my mind with the way things look. I've always been a person who like judges things from the way they look. Even like when I was a child, I had and still do have lots of problems with food and sort of if something looks weird, I'm not gonna eat it. And I think that, that eye, that aesthetic thing serves me well in some places and not so well in others but i think travel definitely has influenced my interior design style and i've had such a brilliant time visiting different places and even just like cafes and hotels and stuff like that and being inspired by things that i see and knowing what i like but it's not necessarily about replicating them it's sort of a very eclectic mix of stuff that goes together it did work in the industry for a while so i think that's helped me develop sort of an eye in terms of how to fit a room together and how things sort of like formulaically make sense in a space um that's definitely something I learned but I think in terms of like color palettes and style and objects and stuff like that that's very much like just intuitive I feel like to each individual and like as long as you're filling your home with things that bring you joy then it doesn't really matter sort of if anyone else likes them and I think interior trends much like fashion trends sort of come and go these days and um yeah I think I've been much more focused in recent years on like calming spaces and spaces to relax but still things that bring me joy and sort of because I spend so much time in bed like things of interest to look at while I'm just lying down a lot of the time so that I think sickness in some way I think influences my the way I decorate my home because yeah I like it to be interesting I spend so much fucking time here <laughs> um but yeah, uh, that's, I think, all of the questions on clothes and stuff like that. Uh, there's some food questions. People say, what's your favourite reading snack? I'm a very messy eater, so like I really shouldn't have my food around my books. Well, Tom would say definitely not. But um, I'm having a real moment for salted popcorn. We don't have a microwave, so it has to be like pre-bought salted popcorn with a um, piece of dark chocolate like broken up into it mm, so yummy i love salt and sweet together that's one of my favorite things and then my friend sage asked me is there a food you wish there was a vegan version of out there and i feel like to be honest there is a vegan version of everything if you go to the right places and sort of when i was backpacking i was very militant with my veganism and i would ate some really cool and delicious stuff in like tiny Colombian towns that were then people just making, veganizing their like traditional family recipes, which was so cool. So I think that is, there isn't anything I wish for sort of, because I know it already exists, but it's just that I, the availability, I guess. Um, and that's also very specific to the Netherlands, I think, because I 
like we love a lot of vegan English food and I don't have a lot of access to it here like um vegan sausages I feel like the Dutch vegan sausages are grim because they are like the vegan version of a Dutch sausage which is more like a smoked sausage or like a German sausage which is different it's like a Cumberland sausage which is like my kind of sausage and I just think in general the vegan options in the Netherlands are just nowhere near as good as what we had back home in general in the supermarket and then specifically in Brighton because Brighton's such a vegan centre um I really miss vegan donuts. There is nowhere to buy a good vegan donut in this goddamn city. It's so annoying. But Berlin has one of my favourite vegan donuts in the world. So I know I know Europe can do it. I just need them to bring an outpost of Bramble's Donuts of Berlin to here. But yeah, there are things I miss. And then I would say like cheese, but like not really because I wasn't really a cheese person. But here actually our like favorite pizza restaurant in the city dope pizza they have amazing homemade like four different kinds of vegan cheese like cashew aged cheese and i just wish the supermarket had better cheese options because i know good vegan cheese exists but it's like really expensive and at least here it's like mostly only available in restaurants so that would be my two cents on vegan things Someone else on my favourite jelly cat is, which made me laugh, but this is him, if you didn't know. I like to collect these stuffed animals called jelly cats. I used to hide them in my videos and I literally don't give a shit, so I put them everywhere. Um, this, his name is Odie and he's a giant octopus and I love him because I love his like wiry tentacles are so satisfying to twiddle. So yes, he's my favourite. I have, wait, where's... This is my second favourite. Tom bought me him for my birthday. He normally, Tom and my best friend Francisco buy me them for like surgeries and birthdays. That's why I receive most of my jelly cats. But this is Crew, Crew's Lee. He's named after a type of Dutch cereal. Um, and he didn't, Tom didn't know he was going to be this small, but like that makes him even funnier to me. And he's a lobster wearing a jumper. And I think he's so cute. So yeah, that's the jelly cat chat. I'm uh, just outing myself on the internet. Um... My favourite thing about Amsterdam, people ask. I think my favourite, I was really, really interesting because I was just in uh, London for quite a while with friends and I had a really stark sort of contrast to sort of getting around. And I think the thing I'm most grateful for, I love most about Amsterdam, is the ease of the public transport and the lack of chaos involved. I don't think anywhere, well, no, that's not true because I have been on other subway systems. Like I lived in Paris for a bit, that metro system is absolutely fucked. And uh, Mexico City that public transport system was horrendous but like I don't think I've lived anywhere or I've been anywhere with as chaotic of a transport system as London just because of so how many people use it but like so many lifts broken so many staircases like what the fuck are we doing in London I know it's old blah 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 but like I'm so grateful in Amsterdam every like everything is either above ground like the tram which is like how I mostly get around so there's like it's completely level you're only ever on the ground or all of our like subway stations have escalators and lifts and it's just like phew, amazing to me that we can have a, well it's not even amazing it's just shit on London that we have such poor sort of accessibility and even discounting the historical aspects even the new stations and lines they're building have like I don't know it's like one in five are wheelchair accessible it's just appalling so yeah my favorite thing here is the ease and accessibility of the public transport system and on top of that is like, i don't really use the bike system unfortunately i do have a bike but i don't I haven't ridden it in months and months and months but um that i think eases the pressure on the public transport system because so many people bike so i love like for other people i love the safety of the bikes i love my boyfriend loves it he loves to get around on his bike like i love that for other people i don't really utilize it maybe one day but um yeah, I think the public transport system here is really good. And I love that I'm never more than 15 minutes really away from my apartment, which just because it's a smaller place to live, but also has such less traffic. We live pretty central in terms of like the suburbs and stuff in the city. So that like gives me a, a, a real sense of safety to know like if something bad was going to happen to me if I was feeling very unwell, like I can get in an Uber and I'll be home in 15 minutes and it won't cost me more than 15 euros. And like, that brings me a real sense of comfort so I guess the size of the city is one of my favorite things and then on top of that it's just a fucking beautiful place to live like the canals and the waterways and the architecture are so beautiful and it is pretty clean unless you're going in like the Jordan on a Sunday morning after a big night out of drunk people who are usually English um so yeah I think the beauty of the city is not lost on me and particularly when I have other people to visit they're like oh god it is just stunning and I'm like yeah I know so yeah I feel really lucky for that as well it's just a wonderful 
like aesthetic place to look at every day. <laughs> um, and then someone said the worst assumptions people make about Amsterdam, like people who haven't been here. And I probably say like sex and weed, obviously, but more so than that, it's that people think that those things make this country way more progressive than it is when like at its heart the politics here are no better than the politics I grew up with in the UK so I guess it's it's sort of like people have this like faux progressive idea of the Netherlands because of these like two taboo subjects that we have even though even if you read into sort of the politics of cannabis and sex work here that they're, they're really not that great either and sort of um the government is is trying to sort of make that even worse for both sex workers and people who <laughs> use marijuana so yeah I would say that's annoying but then there is still a lot of people who visit particularly like older people like my mum comes a lot and she loves it but I know when she speaks to her friends and stuff they're like oh that's weird you're like Amsterdam and I guess people make assumptions about that there's like not much to do here or there's not much that the city offers um which is mostly the opinion like I say of like my mum's friends or like people who are older but I feel like it's frustrating because that's would sort of be like judging London based on like just Oxford Street do you know what I mean like it's there's so much more this city has to offer and so much beauty and stuff that is outside of those typical tourist activities um so yeah um someone asked the thing I miss most about England and aside from obviously my friends and my community which I miss so 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 much um it's like access to convenience foods like I was saying about um not enjoying the vegan food here it's stuff like being able to like go into Sainsbury's and buy like a vegan katsu curry to shove in the microwave or like it's like pre-made vegan stuff we really don't have here and I think even just like there's this brand in the UK that makes these really good like lentil pouches that you shove in the microwave or like heat them up on the stove and it's stuff like that like I haven't really found alternatives for and I know partly it's me because I'm like not very adventurous and stuff like that and I don't want to try new stuff in case it's gross but um and because I judge the way things look and one of the things I found the hardest to get over about living here and I miss the most about the UK is like so many of the um, tinned products here are sold in glass jars and to me there's something very creepy about a glass jar of baked beans so I'm trying to I do I have got over that and like do buy stuff here but yeah I guess it's convenience foods I miss the most and then my friends and my dog my family dog Tintin I miss him so much and we're not allowed a pet in our apartment and that makes me really sad so yes animals friends and food <laughs> and then people say what's my worst crisp flavor cheese and onion without a doubt I think it's an offense to eat cheese and onion in public so smelly and my favorite crisp flavor is McCoy salt and vinegar Walker's prawn cocktail and kettle salt and pepper you cannot buy any of those in the Netherlands if I've got one bit bone to pick about the Netherlands it's the absolute atrocity of crisp selection you have here like why do you think everyone wants to eat paprika all of the time i don't um okay wow this is a long video i'm, I'm flagging here someone said what's the favorite place you've traveled and your future travel aspirations and someone asked my favorite city lots of travel questions this is so hard to answer for only reasons of like my own privilege and because I'm so lucky I backpacked 21 countries before I turned 21 over the course of like three years like sort of different trips back and forth so I've been to a lot of places which makes it very hard to decide which one of my favorite but Tulum in Mexico and just in general the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico is one of the most beautiful like beach places I've ever been and I'm dying to go back and take Tom um and also the food in Mexico mm -mm -mm, 10 out of 10 and then closer to home the Cairngorms in Scotland which is like the national park and in general just like the the rural parts of Scotland are so so beautiful to me and also to me and Tom and me and my mum like we we've made a lot of trips up there in recent years and then when I was a child with my mum we went to Scotland almost every year so that means a lot to me and it's just so beautiful and like kind of amazing that you can drive there from London in like less than a day and that's another thing I miss about England actually someone said is I really miss well I miss having a car but not even that is I miss sort of the access to beautiful landscapes not shit on the Netherlands too much in this video but like it's very flat there aren't no hills going on here there isn't a lot of like variety in the nature I live next to actually a very gorgeous park which is like almost like a nature reserve like it has much more mature wildlife and wilderness than I see but 
yeah just like I miss sort of when we lived in Brighton we could go to the South Downs we could go to the beach we could go to Devon like here I really miss the variety of landscapes which I think is why I'm like thinking so much about how much I love Scotland because it's just so beautiful and rugged and like there's so much to look at and even when I like drive to visit one of my friends who lives in Dorset when I'm back in the UK I'm like wow you guys don't know how good you have it to look at rolling hills on your drives because <laughs> here it's just flat on flat on flat although the beaches in the Netherlands are beautiful and then uh, the south of France is definitely a favourite place uh, I spent a lot of time in France as a child and then I don't know three or four years ago Tom my mum and I have been making like an annual road trip there with our, my mum's dog or my dog Tintin and it's become a really special place for yeah just like switch off time with Tom and my mum and sort of we have such a good time together and I hope like it will be a place where we'll take our kids with my mum and like it's just like I feel very homely and I feel very at home in sort of that bit of France it's so yeah just like so relaxing and soft to me so yeah definitely south of France and then city wise also a place with Tom is Seoul in South Korea we love South Korea so much and it was we went in 2019 like the summer of 2019 at the time I think it was quite a random place to travel but we just really fancied it and we loved it so much if you're ever planning a trip to that part of the world then do not forget about South Korea it's so cool and on that note people said what are your future travel aspirations Tom my mum and I lost a trip we had a trip planned to Vietnam for like two and a half weeks in 2020 my my 25th birthday I think it was like the very start of the pandemic and I like honestly think I look back and think about how naive we were because we really thought that was going to go ahead like right up until the minute it didn't um and yeah so I would love to redo that trip but it was like a very I've been to Vietnam when I was 18 and I'm desperate to take my mum and Tom I know they'd both love it so much they my mum really is keen to do the history bit and just like the landscapes and stuff but me two and a half years ago was way less sick than me now so I think a lot of trouble I'm having with future travel stuff is sort of reckoning with my health and thinking like what's safe to do what's sensible like stuff like that so yeah I don't know I do want to go to Vietnam with my family but I'm just not sure in what circumstance and probably not like a two and a half week like six stop sort of whistle stop tour of a whole country is pretty unrealistic um and on that note Tom and me really want to go to Japan again a place I've been by myself but never with him and because we love South Korea I know he'll love Japan and to me that bit of um East Asia is a lot more manageable to travel just because it's more accessible and my friend Lucy Lucy Webster if you guys ever read um her writing she's a brilliant journey journalist um she's a power chair user and she just did two weeks in Japan and has like written a lot about the accessibility there and I sort of think that would be a feasible option for me to go in my wheelchair and sort of make it work for us in major cities instead of um sort of more road trip rural stuff and then much more realistic i'd love to go back to berlin sometime soon that's my and tom's favorite european city mostly because we love the food scene and the vintage shopping and it's not that far it's like 35 euros on the train and it takes like five hours so I really want to utilize sort of our access to mainland Europe um, in the coming year and we should be going to Berlin in the spring so that'll be fun. Someone asked, okay we're getting to the end, last on the travel note is your favourite museum or gallery in the world? This is such a hard question to answer um, and I was like had a really fun time with Tom reminiscing on all of the like art and stuff I had seen. There's one museum which I was sad to um, see on Wikipedia has closed, It's called. The, it was called the Museum it's in Washington in the States and it was like a museum that focused on journalism and media but it was like a, the most interestingly correlated and creative display of um exhibitions I've ever seen it was so 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 cool there was like this one room where you walked into and the entire 360 was one headline from one day so it would be like the day we had 9-11 on every single sort of newspaper around the world and all these different languages talking about bias and conversation and cultural context and this was way before I was writing this was like when I was a teenager I went um on a trip to the states and yeah that museum has stuck in my head so 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 much so that's the museum and then when I was in Buenos Aires in Argentina I saw a retrospective of Yoko Ono at the like the city it's not the moment but like the, the museum of modern art in Buenos Aires and I thought it was so 
such a cool space and I love love loved some of the art galleries we saw in South America and I just remember that one because I remember seeing Yoko Ono's work and I have a postcard it's like framed in our living room that I think about from there and then in excuse me in Berlin the I'm gonna butcher this hamburger Bonhoff you'll know it. it's like the big famous long flat industrial um art gallery and we saw Wolfgang Tillman say it's one of my favorite photographers um and that was really cool and then closer to home the Barbican is probably my favorite in London I've seen so many cool and brilliant exhibitions there and I love the space I love the conservatory I love the theater there just think it's a very very cool space and I feel really lucky to have like not really thought about how good it was until I stopped living in or near London. Um, sorry, it's getting very dark. Is that any better? Not really. Um, the final question, no, two questions. What type of novel would you write? None. I don't think my book aspirations lie anywhere in fiction, if I'm honest. But never say never. Who knows? I know lots of people sort of find that later in life. But I assume I'll probably write something sort of thinly veiled auto fiction about sickness and interpersonal relationships and stuff like that but I don't really think the world needs another average type of auto fiction book by me so probably won't be doing that um <laughs> but on the book no people say what's the best bookshops in Amsterdam my favorite of all time is Skeltima which is near like Central and Rockin it's like four stories has a really cute cafe inside the stuff is so nice so friendly and the prices are really good and it stocks so many options of every book which I love like export edition paperback hardback American covers you've got choice in Skeltima then I love the secondhand bookshop in the Jordan I think it's just called secondhand English books or English used books it's like near the canal near that like rowdy little bit of um square where there's like a few pubs you've got little steps it's next to a coffee shop and I don't remember what it's called, but I'm pretty sure it's the only like good secondhand one. It's quite near the secondhand market book bit, but I don't ever find anything good in there. So yeah, I love the, the man who works in there. He's like, incredibly grumpy and like unhappy to have customers, but in a way that I find very enjoyable. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're my hot Dutch takes and other questions about life and the world. Hope that's interesting to anyone who's new or just a recap on everything for people who've been around for a while. Hope you enjoyed watching it. I will see you all in the next one. Bye.